Tonight on Children's Hospital, doctors help one-year-old Charlie to hear for the first time. Magic is the only word I can think, really. 17-day-old Megan is rushed to the hospital, struggling to breathe. <coughs> and 12-year-old Barney hops into A&E. Royal Manchester Children's Hospital is now the biggest and most up-to-date hospital for children in the UK. Packed with state-of-the-art equipment, its thousand-strong team of medical professionals treat over 100,000 patients a year in a building the size of 39 football pitches. Working together 24-7 to improve the lives of children when they need it most. One-year-old Charlie looks like any other toddler, but he's not. Charlie can't hear. It's basically living in a world of silence, um, no access to sound. He's almost in his own bubble at the moment. There's no shouting him. Come here, Charlie. And because Charlie can't hear, he's not learning to speak. He doesn't have any language. He would be cooing and, you know, babbling by now, and he's got none of that at all. This is not the first time Emma's had a child who can't hear her. Like Charlie, her daughter Daisy carries a gene that means she was born deaf. I didn't begin to imagine what it was, because I, I didn't even know what deaf meant then. You know, it was just somebody else. Other people were deaf. It was just such a shock. Um, it was almost like she died. But five years ago, Daisy had groundbreaking surgery. She was given an artificial hearing device with an implant inside her head, allowing her to hear in one ear. What's good about having a cochlear implant? You can hear properly. Yeah, and you can play out on the street, can't you? Because you can hear the cars on the road. Yeah. And that you can chat. Yeah, it is. Who's your favourite person to have conversations with? You. <laughs> I call Daisy Bionic because it is like, you know, it's like something out of the Bionic Man. You know, you have this implant and they go from nothing to everything. Now Charlie will have the same operation to restore the hearing in both of his ears. It's immeasurable what it'll mean to me. It's just, you know, the, my son will be able to hear, won't he, you know? And he'll be able to function like Daisy does, really. The hospital speech therapist, Lise Henderson, has been working with deaf children for 15 years. Charlie can't hear because the cochlea, which is his hearing organ, um, doesn't function in the way that it does for you and I. And so the implant takes on that role and provides stimulation that is picked up by the auditory nerve and then carried up to the brain. Lise knows better than anyone that without this operation, Charlie would face many challenges. He wouldn't be able to attend his local mainstream school with his sister. Um, and whilst signing is great and his family would be able to learn sign, there are a limited number of people in the world that can use sign communication. And so Charlie would be restricted to who it was he was able to communicate with. It'll be Lise and her team's job to teach Charlie how to hear and speak after he recovers from the surgery. So when he can hear, what are you going to say to him? Do you want to watch telly? <laughs> Mum Emma knows there are no guarantees. Every child responds differently to the implant. This is Charlie. I don't actually know at this time how successful it will be for Charlie. Well, if he's even a fraction as successful as Daisy, I'll be happy. The hospital's accident and emergency department sees around 50 children a week with breathing problems. The unit has a special resuscitation room for those at high risk. Professor Simon Carley specialises in emergency medicine. His work involves anything from minor cuts and bruises to major trauma cases. Today he's looking after 17-day-old Megan, who's struggling to breathe. She's just been rushed in by her parents, Mark and Laura. 
He's got to find out what's wrong quickly in case her condition becomes critical. Her breathing rate is, is not normal for a child of this age. And she's breathing quite hard. You can see she's sucking her, her chest in and out. We need to find out why that is, whether there's got a little bit of infection or whether there's anything else going on. So she's safe at the moment. She's absolutely safe. Just need to try and find a few more things out. From the parents' point of view, I think it's absolutely terrifying, actually. You've got to try and be honest with them and then try and be as reassuring as you possibly can. When the child is safe, but I'm worried about the baby. I'm sure mum and dad are too. Megan's breathing is monitored while staff run through a battery of tests. First, they need to check for infection. Picking up an infection in a child of this age, they don't have a great deal of reserve, and that can get on top of them quite quick. It's the first set of results back. Kidneys are working OK. Haemoglobin's OK, so they're not anemic or anything like that. So that's not too bad, actually. It's really reassuring. Next, Professor Carley wants to see if Megan's heart has an abnormality. It's a funny age, 17 days. Um, it's an age where we often pick up cardiac problems, and that's a bit of an anxiety for us at the moment. Okay, not getting great images there, but what I can see is heart with four chambers in. That's good. <laughs> so everything so far is going in the right direction. Okay. Do you believe me? Yeah. Okay. Her heart looks normal. A chest X-ray may hold the key to why Megan's pulse is still very high. X-rays. Right. OK. That's interesting. Just this here. There's a definite difference in the lung field from down here to up here. After 60 minutes of intense investigation, nice. Professor Carley has discovered What's why Megan's heart is beating so good. fast. Um, I had a look at the chest x-ray. Yeah. There's an area where the lung has just collapsed down a bit. Yeah. Now, that's not that uncommon. It sounds terrible, mm. but it's not that uncommon in children. And it's either because there's a bit of infection there or maybe just breathe a bit of milk in, and that's caused that area to collapse down. Again, not a major problem, so with a bit of antibiotics and a bit of physiotherapy, to jiggle her about a bit and just free things up, she should do fine. That okay. is absolutely yeah. fantastic. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you later. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. That's a bit <laughs> Megan will have to stay in the hospital until her heart rate comes down, but a course of antibiotics should cure her. Okay. Panic over. One-year-old Charlie was born deaf and will struggle to learn how to speak. But today, he's one of a small but growing number of children to have groundbreaking surgery to restore the hearing in both of his ears. Magic is the only word I can, I can think, really. It's just unbelievable. You know, in him saying his first word, saying mummy and daddy, and those are the things at this moment that I look forward to. Surgeon Professor Ramsden is one of the UK's pioneers of hearing implants for the deaf. OK, let's have a look at Charlie's now. Well, he's definitely got cochlear nerves. He's coming out of retirement to do Charlie's operation. I was very keen to, to come and help. You cannot just suddenly end a, a life's work and interest abruptly. Cochlear implants is one of the things that I spent my professional life doing. It wasn't the only thing, but it's certainly been the most gratifying. He also gave Charlie's sister an implant five years ago. Ready for today? Uh, as ready as I'll ever be, I think. Well, you've been through this before, haven't you? I know, but well, it not make it any easier. It's easy, isn't it? It is easy, isn't it? Tuesday, How's she yes. doing? Very well. Uh, Charlie's going to get both sides done. He is. Fantastic. Charlie's mum, Emma, knows he'll struggle to adapt to the new implant, but it's a risk she's willing to take. I've made the decision for Charlie. And whether that's the right decision or the wrong decision, I don't know, but it's the option of him being sort of mute for the rest of his life or being able to communicate on a verbal level. Professor Ramsden will need to restore Charlie's non-functioning inner ear, the cochlea. 
First, he drills through Charlie's skull and makes room for an implant the size of a two pound coin. Let's have the implant, thanks. This is their radio frequency receiver coil that picks up the messages that come through the skin. Now comes the critical bit. The professor must have the steadiest of hands to insert an electrode into Charlie's tiny hearing organ, the cochlea. So just lead this down gently. Just give me the claw, please. Okay, let's try again. The implant is now sitting nicely round inside the cochlea. Ah, wonderful. It's uh, one of the most um, life-changing operations you could imagine. Here's a child with no hearing, whatever. Uh, previously, that child would have been condemned to a life of signing, uh, special schools. And now uh, we can restore that sense. And the vast majority of these children will be given really a virtually normal life. It takes Professor Ramsden just three hours to give Charlie two implants, one in each ear. Hello. Hello. No problems whatsoever. Good. You'll have a big bandage on his head. Yes. Um, which will keep on overnight and uh, then you can get away. You don't think there'll be any problems? I don't. No, I really don't. It just went in fine. Quite straightforward. Both sides fine. All children are different, aren't they? So I'm trying not to, in my own mind, big it up too much. In four weeks, Charlie's new ears will be switched on, but how will he react to sound for the first time? Coming up, will Charlie's bionic ears work? That even switched on, I felt weepy. And tiny toe trouble for three-year-old Ruby. Around 120 kids visit Royal Manchester Children's Hospital's A&E department every day. Most of them walk in. But not 12-year-old Barney Morehouse. He's been hopping about for the last four days. <laughs> now he's finally managed to pogo into A&E with the support of his long-suffering stepmom. I was playing football in the back garden and it was quite wet, so I slipped and my foot stayed on the ground, but my leg went back. You know, he's forever got injuries for this and that. And he plays rugby, plays football. So it's hurt before like this, but not as bad. And it's normally gone the next day, so I thought I'd be okay this time as well. X-ray sign on the wall. Yeah. He can't put any weight on his foot, so it's down to senior radiographer Julie Poxton to find out if it's broken. Can you point your toes up to the ceiling? That's sore. Yeah. It's okay, pal. I know it hurts. Can't tell. Try to look at the screen, but due to my lack of medical training. I have no idea whether you're broken or Always the sportsman, a little flutter helps pass the time. Father says it is. Says it's what, broken? Yeah. I go on there, I say it's not. OK. <laughs> Just in that room, Barney. Marvellous coffee, eh? Dr Ed Tang is training to be an A&E consultant. He's worked in the department for six months That's and has seen awesome. plenty yeah. of football injuries during his time there. This is a picture of your ankle. Now this is a side view, as if we're looking from the side of your foot itself. Now as it comes around here, there's a hint of a very small fracture. It's actually quite a subtle. <laughs> really tiny. As you can see, it just juts out a little. Now because it's a very, very small fracture itself, all that will happen is that the healing process will have started already. How long do you think it'll take to this is heal itself? Fractures would tend to say sort of heal in sort of five, six weeks, but this will probably heal up a bit quicker than that. You're a fiver richer. Yeah. Well, kind of. Because it's not broke, it's not soft. Mm, yeah. I don't know, really. Might call it evens. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get the nurse and we'll get, okay, there. We'll get you sorted. <sighs> right. I was better than expected. I won't be out for that long. And got to tell my mates I've uh, broken a bone. <laughs> With a break this small, all Barney needs is ankle support and crutches before he hops home for a rest. If you put your bad foot down a little bit, Mm -hmm. That's it. That's great. <coughs> OK. In another corner of A&E, three-year-old Ruby Weatherman's arrived with a poorly big toe. 
it, didn't it? Do you remember what happened with you jumping? When you hurt your poly toe? What did you jump off, Ruby? The sofa. The sofa? It made you cry. It did, didn't it? Going to hospital is a scary experience for a lot of children. Luckily, radiologist Matt Hooper's on hand to make it a little bit friendlier. Sit you down there. It's a special table. Am I going to take your picture with our camera? <gasps> what, you, what, you're going to take a picture? Dad's going to stay with you. You've got your right arm through there, mate. Just through. What do you think? It's cheesy enough, hasn't it? Making Dad look bad. <laughs> <laughs> Can you well, bend this done. knee? Well, and put your foot done. flat on that mattress there. Really still now, Ruby. They need to see if she's got a break or just a nasty bruise. Right then, we're all finished. Thank you very much. Cheers. So this is your poorly foot. And Professor Simon Carley knows that being a good children's doctor is not just about medicine. It's also about reassuring parents and children. Ruby's pictures are on his screen in seconds. You've got two pictures and you've got a broken toe. Oh. Oh no! Oh dear me! But it's not a bad one. It's just a little one. Can you see if I make it bigger? There's a little bit that just comes off there. Oh. It looks a bit red and sore, doesn't it? I'm gonna make it all better, aren't we? Yeah. It's okay. okay. So it's a proper children's little break. It's more of a bend than a break, really. And that's absolutely classic for children's um, breaks. Right. When you get old and, and crumbly like me, you break. Right. And when you're little, you're little and bendy, so you've got a little bend on there. And that means it's going to heal really nicely, no problems at all. Okay. Long term, it's going to be yeah. absolutely beautiful. Okay. So it's paracetamol, yeah. chocolate, yeah. and <laughs> lots of love and attention. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Shall we find? Is that okay? Yeah, well it's done. It's okay. What we're going to do is wrap some special plaster around your toe. All Ruby needs now is a bandage on her foot, more cuddles from mum and dad, and a little bit more distraction. <laughs> She's really brave. Really brave. Uh-oh. Oh, no. It's not very rubbish. Oh, oh, oh. oh sorry. Do you think I'm using the wrong end? Oh, no, no, no it's got one there. Oh, that's How's that? Yeah. Well done, you. See how she goes. If you've got any worries at all, you just bring her back and, and you see us. You know, we never close. You've been a good girl, haven't you? Thank you very much. Thank you. See you later. Four weeks ago, one-year-old Charlie had a pioneering operation at the children's hospital. Surgeons put an artificial hearing device inside his head, which could restore his hearing. If you had a hearing child, you'd be reading to him, and all that. I can't do that with Charlie. So, you know, it's all those little um, things that people take for granted, I think. Those are the things at this moment that I look forward to. Today, he's come to have his new bionic ears switched on and tested for the first time. Apprehensive, excited, um, I don't know, there's so many emotions, it's hard to put it into words really. It's just like, it's like him being, he's being born again today really in a way, we start to move forward now. Speech therapist Lise Henderson will guide Charlie and his mum through the test. Charlie knows his mum loves him, but it's the first time that she's going to be able to tell him and that he'll, he'll be able to hear that. It's a very emotional time for parents. Charlie's new hearing system is hooked up to a computer next door, which will test it with a series of sounds. His dad and sister are waiting eagerly for it to be switched on. It's still in the game. It hasn't even switched on, I feel weepy. It's going to upset him when he's my boy. Okay, sweetheart. Most of the time, I think, for the little ones, it's scary. Because children who've never heard before find the world very bewildering when they can suddenly hear. But when we get tears, I always say to the parents, at least you know it's working. We're going to start stimulating, but at a really low level. We're ready to roll, Morag, whenever you are. It's beeping now. We'll just keep creeping it up until we see him do something that makes us think he can hear. But sadly, there are no tears. While it's unusual for cochlear implants to fail, it does happen and would mean Charlie would have to undergo the operation all over again. Yeah. I can't tell if he's actually hearing anything at all. And it may, this may be very, very quiet to him, so we might make it a bit louder, just 
It will work. Won't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's getting me paranoid now. No, 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 no. In the room next door, the volume on the machine hooked up to Charlie's hearing device is raised one last time. It seems wrong to want to make a child cry, but it's the only way they'll know if it's working. At last, Charlie gives a sign. Right down. He's hearing sound for the first time. What is it? Oh, look, what's this? There we go. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. It's, it's always an anxiety that the, you know, that the implant is going to work, that your baby's going to hear. She's not alone when people worry that. But it's great that we got the responses. I felt really apprehensive because I thought, oh, my God, is it not working after all this? I mean, it's silly, really, because... I've been through it all before with Daisy, but then I felt upset because you could see him getting, you know, building up. It was like, what's that noise? And it's still there and it's not going away. What is it? But, I mean, you know, it's good that it's working. It's a positive move forward now. See that? Yeah, it's not round there, it's me. No, yeah, he's, it was he's definitely fingers. looking. You listen with your brain, not with your ears, and it's just that Charlie's ears weren't working. So already his brain is starting to work out that there is a signal, which is great. Emma will now have to teach Charlie how to use his new hearing system at home. This is his pan, he'll wear this. It's his battery. Oh, yeah. so... <laughs> Sorry, is it here, is it? Emma's already done this once, so she knows how much hard work is involved, but she also knows how much fun we have getting kids started with the process of learning to talk. It's like having a new life again, isn't it, really? Starting from being a baby again. Charlie's surgery couldn't have gone any better. In a few months' time, he should start recognising sounds and maybe even say his first word. The miracle his mum's been hoping for.